After what you thought was a nice long sleep, you open your eyes to what seems like unending darkness. It's cold and a dampness lingers in the air. You try to sit up but your head, it bashes against something hard. You try to move your arms and your legs but whichever way you move them, they too hit something hard. You can feel a soft satin padded lining. Strange. Then the chilling realisation hits you. You're in a coffin. You have been buried alive. You start to panic, your heart races and it's difficult to breathe. You scream and you shout until you're hoarse. You bang on the lid until your poor hands, they're bloodied and bruised. You scratch through the satin lining until your nails chip as they reach the thick solid wood underneath. Your panic turns to despair. It's no use. No one can hear your cries. They're swallowed up by the darkness of the night. Throughout history and all across the world, there are hundreds of stories of people being mistakenly buried alive. Some true, some highly dubious. Fear of this fate worse than death, also known as tapophobia, was rampant and who could blame people? It was all over the papers, it was in folklore and woven into literature. The master of horror himself, Edgar Allan Poe, was obsessed with the idea of being buried alive. The theme runs through many of his works, including the chilling story aptly titled The Premature Burial. Even George Washington was afraid. His final words were, I'm just going, have me decently buried, and do not let my body be put into the vault in less than three days after I am dead. This fear of being buried alive peaked throughout the 18th and the 19th centuries. There was even a London Association for the Prevention of Premature Burial, and this was formed in 1896. In 1905, they published their book called Premature Burial and How It May Be Prevented. This listed an astonishing 161 cases of people being dissected, embalmed or buried while still among the living and 222 very close calls. One of the authors himself actually had a very close call. As a child, he was thought to have died from drowning, but he was still very much alive. He woke up in a mortuary surrounded by corpses. The trauma that this must have caused him is unimaginable. Now, we can't have a video on being buried alive without a few true accounts, can we? So here are some to keep you up at night. We're in Basingstoke, England for this one. The year is 1674. Now, there are quite a few different versions of this, so I've gone with the one that I thought was the most interesting. The unfortunate soul is Madame Blunden, a woman with a love for brandy, and the wife of William Blunden, a very rich businessman that was well loved in the community. One evening, while Mr Blunden was out of town on one of his many work trips, Madame Blunden was feeling slightly unwell and so she sent for some poppy water from a nearby apothecary. Poppy water was known for its sedative and also its pain relieving effects. Sitting in a wonderfully comfortable chair, she drank nearly the whole concoction over the course of an evening, and then she retired to bed. As you can imagine, this was far more poppy water than any person should have in one sitting. The next morning, Madame Blunden did not wake up. The servant started to get a little bit concerned, and so they went in to check on her, and they found their mistress in a gentle slumber. They thought better of trying to wake her, and so they left her to rest for a little bit longer. Hours went by, and Madame Blunden still did not stir. The servant started to fear the worst, and so they sent for a doctor to examine her. Then the doctor held a mirror to her nose and mouth to check for signs of breathing, but nothing. Then he bled her. I mean, you can't call yourself a doctor unless you do some bloodletting. She still didn't stir. It would appear that poor Madame Blunden was dead. The doctor contacted her husband to let him know of her death. Of course, he wanted to be there for her funeral, and so he asked for them to wait until he was able to return. However, Madame Blunden's family had other ideas, and what a lovely family she had. They decided that because they were having a spell of hot weather, and Madame Blunden was fat, their words. The vile smell from her body was just too much to bear, and so they needed to bury her as quickly as possible. So they set to work, not waiting for her husband to return. Now, clearly they didn't get her a big enough coffin, because apparently they had to push her arms and legs in with a stick to try and force her into the thing. One of the pallbearers even joked that the coffin was too short because he had clearly seen her move, as she couldn't lie easy. <laughs> 
The day after the funeral, some children were playing in the graveyard, as you do as kids. And then they heard a voice coming from Madame Blunden's grave. They edged closer, and then they heard her shouting, Take me out of my grave, along with fearful groans and dismal shriekings. This filled the children with terror, and they ran to their schoolmasters to tell him what had happened. The schoolmaster thought that they were just making up stories, and so he gave them a good telling off. The children went back to the graveyard the next day, where they heard the same chilling groans and screams. They told the schoolmaster, again, who thought, you know what, maybe I should listen to them. So he followed them to the graveyard, and he too heard the screams. The church wardens were informed they were the ones that would have the last word on whether her body could be exhumed. They had quite a long discussion about it, and finally her body was unearthed that evening. The sight that greeted them when her coffin was opened was awful. Her poor body was badly bruised, bloody and very beaten from her struggle to escape. There were no remaining signs of life that they could see, but the church wardens instructed a guard to watch over her just in case. But it was a wet night and the guard fancied a drink. I mean, surely the woman must be dead by now. So the guard put the lid back on the coffin and off to the pub he went, leaving poor Madame Blunden all alone. The next morning, when the coffin was opened again, it was clear that Madame Blunden had still been alive, and she had tried to escape again. She had scratched at her body and her face, and her mouth was a bloody mess. She had also torn off her burial shroud. A doctor was summoned to examine her, and they determined that she was now indeed fully dead, no coming back. Following this absolutely terrible fiasco, there was of course an inquest. The doctor was actually let off the hook because he had carried out the very foolproof test of using a mirror to see if Madame Blunden was breathing. In the end, the town of Basingstoke had to pay a rather hefty fine for the neglect of poor Madame Blunden. Our next story takes us to South Carolina in the summer of 1915. Essie Dunbar, a 30-year-old woman, had suffered an epileptic fit. Poor Essie collapsed in a heap on the floor and stopped breathing. Her panicked family quickly called for a doctor. Dr Briggs arrived and examined Essie. He checked for signs of life, but sadly she had no pulse and she wasn't breathing. Dr Briggs declared Essie dead, and so her distraught family started making plans for her funeral. It was the custom at the time for funerals to be held pretty quickly after death. Essie's sister was out of town and the earliest she could make it back for was the next morning, and so The funeral was scheduled for 11am the next day. On the day of the funeral, Essie was put in her finest clothes and placed into a wooden coffin, with her cross engraved on the lid. A lengthy service was conducted by three preachers, each taking turns to perform the various rites. The service came to an end and Essie's sister had still not arrived. The family delayed the burial as long as they could, frequently looking back, hoping to see Essie's sister coming up the hill. After a while, the family decided that they simply couldn't wait any longer. Perhaps the sister's train was cancelled. And so, Essie's coffin was lowered into a six-foot hole in the ground and half a ton of dirt was piled upon it. A few minutes later, a mournful chant could be heard. Essie's sister had finally arrived. She walked towards the coffin, chanting and clapping. She pleaded with the preachers to please let her see her sister one last time. The preachers discussed it for a bit. They could really see the pain in her eyes. And so they agreed to have the coffin dug up. They removed the screws from the coffin and slowly opened the lid. Nothing could prepare Essie's sister or the rest of the mourners for what happened next. Shocked gasps and cries could be heard all around. The crowd looked on in terror. Essie had sat up in her coffin and was smiling at her sister. She wasn't dead at all. The shocked preachers, they just couldn't believe what they were seeing and all three fell backwards into the grave. One preacher even ended up with broken ribs from the ordeal because the other two preachers were trampling over him trying to escape the grave in a panic. Everyone thought that she must be a ghost or a zombie. The crowd of mourners ran away screaming. Even Essie's sister was afraid. Instead of feeling joy at seeing her sister smiling at her, she was filled with terror and she too ran away screaming. Essie climbed out of her coffin, confused as to what all the commotion was about. She began to walk towards her family this made things worse. The zombie was now chasing after them. Everyone rushed into town in a frenzied state of pure fear. Alone and very bewildered, Essie walked back into town. 
Her family and friends were still in shock, unable to process what had happened. It took a while for them to calm down and realise that she was not, in fact, a zombie, just their beloved Essie that had been buried before her time. For a while after, many still viewed her as a zombie or a haunted woman. She became quite the local legend. Essie would live for another 47 years. She died of natural causes on the 22nd of May 1962, outliving the doctor who pronounced her dead the first time. So why were all these people being buried alive? Well, it was actually quite difficult to tell if someone was dead. Most of the time, a doctor wasn't even there to make the decision, and it was left to your family members or an unqualified doctor's assistant. Lord help you if you were in an area where plague or cholera epidemics were raging. People were dropping like flies, and the victims were being buried quickly to try and prevent the spread of disease. Well, not buried really, more like thrown into mass graves with no one checking that these people were actually dead. If you passed out from drinking a bit too much, you could very well end up being carted off with a load of other dead bodies to a plague pit. In 1558 in the town of Dijon, the dead body of a woman was thrown into a mass grave. The poor woman wasn't dead though. The next morning she awoke surrounded by bodies. She tried to climb out, but the weight of the corpses on top of her was just too much. It must have been a horrific assault on their senses. Oh, the sight, the sound, and oh, the smells. Four days would pass with the poor woman trapped under the weight of these corpses. Luckily, some gravediggers had come by to drop off some more bodies. They heard her muffled cries and they rushed into action. They managed to pull her out of the pit and she was taken back home where she would make a full recovery. Though, I wonder if she ever slept soundly again after that. I certainly wouldn't. There were all sorts of bizarre ways that people tried to verify death. I'll give you a little snapshot. One was the tobacco enema. Oh no, it's not what it sounds like, is it? Oh, it is exactly what it sounds like. Tobacco smoke blown up the rear end with some very powerful bellows. Another popular one was mirrors held up to the nose or mouth to check for breathing, like they did with Madame Blunden from earlier. Sometimes they also tried to see if the person responded to having the soles of their feet sliced or burned with a, a hot poker. But these methods were all prone to failure. Even up to the 19th century, the medical community agreed that putrefaction was the most reliable sign that someone was dead. Putrefaction is basically the body decomposing, so you'd have to watch the body for a few days and see what happened. Things were made even more complicated by medical conditions such as catalepsy. This can very often be mistaken for death. Catalepsy is a trance-like state where your body can become rigid with your limbs staying in a fixed position. The person may have decreased responsiveness to stimuli, and the vital signs such as breathing and heartbeat can slow to the point that they're very, very difficult to detect. The hunt for a better death signal was on. During the 19th century, many competitions were held in France with a very large prize to whomever could come up with a reliable way to check if someone was dead. There was no shortage of absolutely ridiculous entries, but eventually there were two that showed promise. First I'll tell you some of the more fanciful ones. One person suggested that a long needle with a flag attached to one end should be stuck into the heart of the apparently dead person. If the heart was still beating, the flag would happily waggle around, signifying that they were still alive. I don't think they'd be alive for much longer after that. I know, right? <laughs> One German contestant said that he could hypnotise the apparent corpses to find out whether they were dead. Another suggestion was putting many leeches around the person's rear end. One entrant suggested using a strong pincer to pinch the person's nipples. I could go on for quite a while, but I won't. The winner of the 1848 competition was Eugène Bouchou, who suggested the use of the stethoscope to see if a patient's heart had stopped beating for at least two minutes. However, stethoscopes back then were nothing like the ones we have today. They were wooden tubes that were similar to hearing trumpets. The sound of a heartbeat could be very easily missed with one of these, especially if the person was intoxicated with a very large amount of sedatives. It certainly wouldn't have worked on our poor Madame Blunden from earlier. The winner of the 1895 competition was Dr. Icard. They suggested that you could inject a fluorescent compound under the skin 
This would turn the skin a bright yellow colour and the eyes a lovely shade of emerald green, if working circulation was still present. Across Germany, the waiting mortuary was becoming popular. In these, bodies were laid out on stretchers for days and they were watched by an attendant through a window for signs of life. They would be buried only after showing signs of putrefaction. Some of these mortuaries had a system of strings attached to the fingers of the bodies and connected to a bell or a large harmonium, and this would act as an alarm system if the person revived. Now, decomposing bodies swell and they move, so there were lots of airy false alarms with poor attendants woken up by a very, very unholy symphony. Being an attendant must have been an awful job. The stench from the bodies must have been unbearable. Some of these waiting mortuaries were extravagant affairs, with corpses wearing their finest clothes surrounded by beautiful artwork and wonderful flower displays. You could even visit one for a fee and wander around with grotesque awe at the rows and rows of putrefying bodies. Waiting mortuaries were expensive to build and run though, so an alternative was the security or safety coffin. The earliest example of one of these was for none other than Duke Ferdinand of Brunswick himself. He had a coffin constructed with an air hole so that he'd be able to breathe, there was also a window so he could have some lovely light, and it was closed with a lock and key rather than nails. There were so many different suggestions of how security coffins should be made. Some suggested that they should have a string tied around the person's hands that would be connected to a bell or a flag on the surface. The flag would kind of be like the ones you have on those mailboxes you get in the US. Though, as mentioned earlier, dead bodies swell and they move, so there would be many false alarms. To try and get around this, it was suggested that the alarm mechanism could be activated by turning a handle instead. Some suggested that they could have a sort of trumpet connected to them, and an attendant could stop by each fresh grave and have a little sniff to see if they could smell through the tube whether the body was decomposing. That's definitely not a job I'd want to do. <laughs> Me either. Others suggested coffins with spring-loaded doors and ejection seats. An important feature in a lot of them was a permanent air supply. Unsurprisingly, security coffins never really took off. The main concern was, what if the bell, the flag, or whatever alarm mechanism you'd chosen didn't work? With that permanent air supply, you could be trapped alive in that coffin for a very, very long time, frantically screaming and trying to jingle the bell or waggle the flag to no avail. Today, you'll be glad to know that the chances of being buried alive are slim to none. But in 2018, a Brazilian woman's grave was dug up after people living nearby heard screaming and banging coming from the cemetery. Her family state that sadly there was evidence that she tried to escape. There was blood in the casket, the nails in the coffin had been pushed upwards and there were injuries to her hands and also to her forehead. Despite this, I think you can probably sleep soundly tonight knowing that there's a large battery of tests to reliably check whether you're dead. No tobacco in Emma's in sight. Stay safe, maybe arrange to be buried a few days after you die. And I hope you have a magnificent day.